Hello, everybody. This is Ryan Nemec welcoming you back to the VIA Pioneer Speaker Series. This is our, our second session. Last, uh, last month, we had the, the privilege of hearing from uh, Dr. Tayyab Rashid talk about character strengths and psychotherapy. Uh, next month, we'll have the pleasure of listening to Dr. Carol Kaufman speaking about uh, character strengths and uh, executive coaching and the business world. And today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Robert Biswas-Diener and talking about character strengths in coaching and really advanced issues in the strengths world. And before I introduce Robert, uh, I'd like to just uh, say one little bit of, of housekeeping, and that is to bring your your attention to um, the slide here on the screen, which is just kind of alerting you to uh, the next session of our online course that we have. So many of you have taken this course. This is a seven-week uh, online intensive in which we integrate lecture and Skype group interactions and, uh, and various uh, articles and handouts for sort of a, a wide array of learning about uh, basic issues and uh, more complex issues in the world of, of character strengths. And so that's an exciting thing that uh, I would encourage you to uh, sign up for. And you can see that it starts uh, January 12th, and you can contact Kelly uh, at via character, Kelly A at via character.org for more information, uh, or go to that link uh, to sign up, or just go to our website. There's a link there as well. Uh, and I want to also note that you can, throughout this session, if you have particular questions for Dr. Biswas Diener, I'd like you to uh, email me. Uh, you can email me at ryan at viacharacter.org, and I'll be happy to then uh, uh, pass on those questions to Robert during the call. And uh, our order of agenda for today's session is to start with uh, a lecture by uh, Robert, who will go into the advanced issues uh, in relation to strengths. Then he'll, he'll pause and take some of your questions, and so I will relay those to him. And then uh, Robert's actually going to do a live coaching session which is just incredibly exciting uh, and very brave on his part. So uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And he'll be doing a, uh, the live coaching session that will uh, be exemplifying some of the issues that he'll be talking about in his session. And then we'll conclude after that with a little debriefing and any other final questions uh, from, uh, from all of you. And uh, just a little reminder that this is being recorded and will be archived on our, on our website. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Robert Biswas Diener here. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Biswas Diener is this incredible guy. He is someone who has traveled the world in speaking and in just exploring the world of, of strengths and positive psychology, consulting to organizations around the world, and doing speaking gigs and presentations at major conferences around the world in these areas. And uh, he certainly is one of the authorities in the world of positive psychology and in the world of strengths. And so I, I think this, that he's really sort of a, a perfect uh, embodiment of the word pioneer. And, and th this whole speaker series is, as it's called, Via Pioneers Speaker Series. Those people who are leading the charge in strength-based applications and research in their respective fields of education or coaching or business or psychology. Um, and so Robert is that pioneer. He actually was one of the uh, first people who uh, did the pioneering work with Via uh, over a decade ago. He was the one who went to remote areas in uh, northern Greenland and uh, in Africa, speaking with the Maasai people and various other cultures to help to establish the cross-cultural similarities of character strengths across cultures. And he was asking all these different peoples those kinds of questions like, uh, is this particular strength valued in your culture? And do you have institutions and rituals to build that particular character strength? Uh, and do you have individuals that display an exemplary amount of the strength, and so on. So it's, it's Robert that, uh, that uh, is credited for, all, for this great work, and he has uh, one or two articles on that topic uh, that um, we could send you if you like. Um, so it, Robert has continued uh, doing extensive work with strengths and applications. He has a number of different books that many of you know of, Positive Psychology Coaching, Practicing Positive Psychology Coaching, uh, and uh, he actually is running a consulting business called Positive Acorn, and so we would encourage you to check out that website, positiveacorn.org, uh, I'm sorry, .com. 
And I also want to highlight a, uh, a book that he has coming out next year called The Courage Quotient. And so without uh, further ado, let me pass it over to, to you, Robert. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Ray. I appreciate the very kind introduction, especially the part where you called me an incredible guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very generous of you, if nothing else. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the line, um, to those of you who are listening in live, and also extend a welcome to those of you who are listening in on, on the recording, um, even though it's, it's asynchronous and, and we're not here um, together in, in this exact moment in time, I, I still feel connected to you and, and am glad that you are able to listen to this recording. Um, I'm going to uh, assume that the people who, who are listening to this have a, a true interest, not just in strengths themselves, which of course are fascinating, but in the use of strengths and, and applying strengths in, in real world situations and not merely have an academic interest in strengths. Um, largely I will be using the word coaching and talking about strengths in, in a coaching context. But I want to be very clear that, that my commentary is not limited to the coaching endeavor or to professional coaching, whether that be life coaching or executive coaching, organizational coaching. I view um, many of the things I'm going to talk about today as germane to, um, to education, to parenting, uh, certainly in some cases to psychotherapy, um, as, as or to coaching, um, to management as well. So really... Really, um, although I'm going to use coaching as sort of a, a, a short a linguistic shorthand for working with clients or working with other people, um, I, I do not intend this um, information to be solely of interest to those who are working as coaches. Um, it really is applicable to, to everyone. Um, if, if we could have just the very first slide up, Ryan, called Developing Strengths, sort of just the, the overview uh, title slide. Um, I, I would like to start with just a, a, a tiny insight for those of you who are interested in the VIA assessment. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that, that if you are on this site and listening to this recording, you, are, uh, you have taken the VIA at some point in your life. You, you know a little bit about the backstory. Um, but, but I want to tell you a, a, a small story that you probably don't know about, which is when I was first starting out in, in this field, and that must have been about 1998 or so, um, I had the extraordinary privilege <laughs> to be invited. I, you know, I was just fresh out of grad school. I, was, I, I certainly had no name or reputation for myself. Um, but I was invited to take part um, in, in really a secretarial capacity, just as a note taker, in a, a meeting of the Positive Psychology Steering Committee. So at that time, it was Mike Sheik sent Mahai, uh, Marty Seligman, my father, Ed Diener, um, and I believe uh, George Vallant from Harvard was there as well. And the five of us flew to Hawaii where Marty um, rented a very nice house on the beach, and, and we sat around, and the, the, um, the steering committee said, okay, we're, we're going to have a, a two-day agenda to talk about some topic that, that's going to be important to this, this new field of positive psychology. Now, mind you, this was the year 2000. Marty was president of the American Psychological Association. He had not yet rent, written Authentic Happiness. Um, most of the things we know about as being positive psychology had not yet happened. They had not yet been thought of. And Marty had a specific agenda for us to talk about. Um, and that agenda was, let's discuss psychotherapy and diagnosis. And he pointed to the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and he said, look, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors everywhere, we, we are able to, to pinpoint uh, the symptoms that are associated with anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, all these other psychological maladies. Wouldn't it be nice to have, and this is the first time I ever heard this phrase, an un-DSM. Wouldn't it be nice to have an intellectual counterpoint to a, a taxonomy of maladies? What if instead we could talk about the symptoms of virtue? 
And it was the first time I heard this, and it, it was extraordinary, an extraordinary moment for me. It was so eye-opening, and, and what a radical thinker um, Marty was. And, and mind you, this, this was, as far as I know, one of the very earliest conversations um, that later led to the development of, of the VIA. Um, and at that time, it was, it was quite exciting because there were not 24 strengths. There were simply the idea that there could be strengths and that strengths were worth measuring and worth talking about and worth dealing with. We had no idea what even defined a strength. We had no idea what would be included. If we started looking at, at strengths across history, if we started looking at strengths in literature and uh, you know, fiction and, and etiquette manuals and, and on television, if we looked at, at strengths across culture, what would we find? Would it be a list of 50? Would it be a list of 10? We, we had no idea. And the amount of possibility that dripped from that meeting was, was one of the intellectual turning points for me in my life um, to, to really just go forward with an idea, hungry with an idea, and, and make it manifest. That, that really there's nothing stopping you from creating essentially what, what we now think of as intellectual property. And I don't mean that in the proprietary way. I mean that simply in the, the way of if you have an idea, go for it, start researching it, follow it up, see what's out there. And this, of course, is what Marty Seligman is so brilliant at. Um, and I feel that, that I'm, I'm just so privileged to have been sitting with these intellectual giants in this room looking out at the ocean as the very first conversations about the VIA happened. And of course, those conversations led to, um, to the partnership we know of with uh, Chris Peterson and Marty Seligman. Um, pioneering really the, the 24 strengths that we now know of as, as the VIA character strengths and, and the assessment uh, that goes with it. Uh, as, as Ryan mentioned, I was interested in, in checking up on Chris and Marty to see if, if they were correct. Were these 24 strengths really, uh, really cross-culturally valued? Were they really cross-culturally understood. So um, I took the list to northern Greenland. I took the list to the equator where the Maasai tribal people live. I gave them to the, uh, the most exotic group of all, uh, University of Illinois students. Um, and I did. I asked, I asked people in these three samples, um, do, do you have a word in your language for, for this concept? Do you desire this? Would you want your child to have this particular strength? Are there institutions that would support this strength? And by and large, across these, these types of questions, people said yes. And in fact, they endorsed, um, they endorsed these criteria for strengths uh, overwhelmingly, regardless of if they were at the North Pole or the equator. So, so I was, uh, again, felt privileged to be in on the ground floor of some of the earliest VIA research work. Now that's, of course, the, the research, and it is not the practice. But it did not take long for this, this wonderful assessment to, to come about before people started wanting to use it. Could we go to the next slide, Ryan, where we should see a, a little boy making, making some muscles? Um, it's, it's interesting how people started using this. There were a number of coaches who, who got wind of the idea that character strengths were good. Certainly managers um, uh, already had this on their map. Um, there, there were a number of people in a number of professions that, that really wanted um, that really wanted this, this information to be um, not just something that describes culture or not just something that describes moral education, but really something that we can use on a on a day to day basis. They really wanted this translated into skills. Um, and the the earliest use really was what I call identify and use, which is people gave the via assessment to their clients. They allowed them to identify their strengths, typically what we would know of as their top five signature strengths. So you might have a client walk in with curiosity, love of learning, humility, forgiveness, and gratitude. And you say, great, OK, you've got those strengths. First of all, it's nice to know that you have those. It's nice to focus on what's right with you for a change. Um, and then what people did is said, now let's have you go use those. Let's, let's have you use those. And principally, 
they asked two types of questions, or they made two types of prescriptions. They said, I'd like you to use your top five strengths more. And in the second case, I'd like to use your top five strengths in a new or novel way. Now, let me be clear on the first point. I don't think that it's a very good prescription to say you should use your strengths more. I think uh, it's better to back up and, and ask a necessary preceding question. Should you use your strengths more? Certainly there's a, a wealth of research out there that shows that people who identify and use their strengths are happier, that uh, they are less prone to depression, they may be buffered um, uh, from depression, uh, they make more progress on goals, they experience higher self-esteem. Um, there's, there's definitely uh, a preponderance of evidence pointing to the idea that, that strengths use and strengths identification um, are, are worthwhile and desirable endeavors. Um, but I think that if you just uh, uh, give your clients this idea that you should use it more, it's a bit unsophisticated. Um, I, I think instead you should say, should you use it more, and, and determine the amount in which you use it, and, and you very, very, very may well uh, uh, recommend that your client use it more, um, but I, I can easily imagine using strengths less uh, as well as more. On the second point, using strengths in a novel way, in a new way, I, I initially had kind of mixed feelings about that. I thought on the one hand, um, well, you know, it's, it's kind of kind of interesting. It's, it's getting clients to think in an in a outside-the-box way about their own personal qualities, so that's cool. Um, on the other hand, do your clients really need to use them in a new way? Maybe your clients are really good at these things and are using them just fine. And, uh, you know, why fix what's, what's not broken? You know, maybe the way they're using them is already optimal. Why, why, why try and change that? Um, but, but really, I liked the idea that, that coaches and other practitioners were starting to get a little playful because I thought that just using it more was a bit simplistic. So using it in novel ways started to be uh, a bit more nuanced. Um, then I started hearing from people like couples therapists that were using this work with couples, um, allowing the, uh, the members of the couple to, to exchange their, their VIA results with one another. And I thought, well, isn't that cool? Isn't that a great gateway to appreciation, mutual appreciation, and, and the healing process in, in the often plagued couples who are in therapy together? Um, so I thought, wow, what, what if we can go beyond this simple identify and use it approach and actually start talking about how we can develop strengths? So if we could go to the next slide, Ryan. Uh, you should see something here that looks like a speedometer. And um, the speedometer was created by Alex Lindley in, in uh, England. And, and he essentially said, you know, you can overuse strengths and you can underuse strengths. And what determines how much a strength should be used, the appropriate amount, is the situation. Strengths must exist in context. And it's the context that determines their use. So really what I became alarmed about was what I perceived as um, coaching and, and other practitioners uh, who just took this sort of context-free approach. Your client has strengths. We've identified their strengths. That inherently must be good. Now we should just send them out in the world to use their strengths. Great, and we're done. But really, people exist in these very complex situations. And it's these situations that have to be evaluated in terms of how they fit together with the strengths. And, and this is what led me to my work in, in strengths development. So if we could flip to the next slide, it's called Strengths Development Summary. You'll see that I think that there are different ways to develop your strengths. So this, this pushes us beyond um, a single dimension. Use your strength more. Use your strength less. Uh, the first of them is proficiency. Are you good at the strength? Typically, you are pretty good, but could you be even better? To use a non-VIA example, if you uh, think of a person shooting baskets, a basketball player, um, they could be pretty good. They might make 80% of their shots. It would be a huge number of shots to make, but maybe they could get even better at it. Maybe that they could um, start making outside shots from far away or, or making inside shots or, or dunks or free throws, all different types of shots, and they could actually just increase their accuracy. 
That's, that's developing proficiency, and that's one dimension that you can work with your clients on in terms of um, developing their strengths. Um, frequency is a completely different dimension. Frequency is how often. Are, are you using your, your strengths too seldomly? Are you using them optimally in terms of uh, the timing? So a secondary dimension there for development. And the third is, is regulation, and that's the amount. Um, and, and here you can take a, a very simple strength like creativity, and you can see that, um, that, that creativity comes in different sizes, if you will. It's great to do a brainstorming session. Let's say you want to create a website, something simple. Um, and it would be great to, to have a creative person on board who could think of, oh, I don't know, 20 different ideas. But you probably don't want someone to generate 20,000 different ideas because it becomes an unwieldy amount of creativity. There's an optimal amount, and people have to be able to regulate depending on the, the circumstances, the needs, the people they're with, and, and so forth. Um, and really, that is the, the basis of strengths development theory, is that it, it, it stands on the shoulders of the traditional identify and use approach, and it says, let's take it a bit further. So if we could advance to um, the next slide, Ryan, and that slide, I want it to be the one that says strengths development model, and it has five little squares in a circle. Could you let me know if you have that one? Uh, got it. Thank you. So these are the, the five areas that I think are really helpful to think about when working with clients and, and working specifically with strengths with clients. And they are strengths, to, strengths constellation, strengths blindness, strengths of sensitivity, and the social costs of strengths. At the heart of these is the question of whether strengths are traits. And, and that really is the fundamental idea of um, strengths development theory, because the more you think of strengths as just being traits, the less you think that strengths can be changed and developed. So are strengths traits? Um, Michael Steger at Colorado State University conducted uh, via research with twins, and he found that there is definitely a genetic component to, to character strengths. Similarly, Alex Lindley, who I mentioned before from England, found a, a, a correlation between the VIA strengths and big five personality traits, which they themselves are um, at least partially genetically determined. Uh, Chris Peterson at the University of Michigan has found <clears throat> enormous agreement across um, across rankings of VIA strengths across cultures, suggesting that things like curiosity um, likely have a, a, a genetic underpinning um, and, and work out for humanity as a whole. That is, they're beneficial. So yes, there, there seems to be some uh, evidence that, that strengths are certainly trait-like. If you read the writings of, of people uh, who are scholars in the yeah, they would agree that, that strengths seem to be traits. If you um, look at a quote by, by Peterson and Seligman in their book on the VIA classification of strengths. They describe strengths very specifically as traits. I'll read you the quote. The stance we take toward character is in the spirit of personality psychology, and specifically that of trait theory, but not the caricature of trait theory held up as a straw man and then criticized by social learning theorists in the 1970s. We instead rely on the new psychology of traits that recognizes individual differences that are stable in general, but also shaped by an individual setting and thus capable of change. And I think that that's really important to remember, that we do expect quite a bit of stability in, in, in your strengths, that you're not going to you know, flip from a completely grateful person to a completely ungrateful person, but that there's also going to be some, some variation. And, and personality theorists call this longitudinal stability. That is, if you're grateful this year, you're probably grateful next year. But then there's also cross-situational stability, which is just because you're grateful at a dinner party and a birthday 
party does not necessarily mean you're going to be grateful in every single circumstance. So there you're going to find more variability. So when working with people, the idea is that strengths really are sort of these potentials, these potentials that can be cultivated through, through work and effort. Um, if we could advance forward to, um, to the strengths tilt slide, it's got a little top on it. Um, this is the idea that your strengths interact with your interests and, and with your values. I think this is one of the, the big open areas for, for future research and strengths. Um, that, that we know that, that strengths are associated with values. You know, the VIA itself stands for values in action. Um, and I think of strengths um, as being the delivery vehicles for our values. That strengths essentially are like a freight train, and we load our values onto them. And it's through our, our strengths, things like gratitude and creativity, that, that we deliver them to the world. Um, but they also interact with our interests. So a person who has bravery, for example, and is interested in nature and the environment may end up taking up rock climbing. A person who has courage as a strength, who is interested in social justice, on the other hand, may end up being a public policy advocate. So in both cases, you have courage. Bravery is this core strength. But it, it's going to manifest differently depending on personal interests. If we could fast forward to um, the strengths constellation slide, Brian, that shows the galaxy. Strengths constellations are essentially the idea that strengths don't exist in isolation. We, we sometimes talk about strengths as if you're a creative person and that creativity um, just is all by itself. But the truth is um, your strengths fit together like Lego pieces. Um, they, they really click with one another. So um, a, a constellation is when you sort of get this emergent higher order property that, that is the result of two specific strengths uh, working together. So imagine someone with the via strength of leadership. But person A has leadership paired with authenticity. They're likely to get someone who, who really is a charismatic leader, who's really straightforward and honest, who, who presents uh, him or herself in a very frank way to people. Now, that that leadership may actually look different than the person, uh, but then person B, who has leadership as a strength, but paired with social intelligence, who comes across as quite sensitive and, and smooth and understanding of, of the interpersonal dynamics, who may, in fact, be less charismatic, but may be seen as, as more socially nimble. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, that one versus the other is a better way of leadership. I'm just suggesting that, that these strengths fit together in very different ways. Uh, I'll give you another quick example of this that might make sense, which is um, someone who's high in forgiveness. Well, uh, that's a, a great thing to be high in, I think. But um, if that, that forgiveness is, is matched with a, a high strength of gratitude, that's going to look one way as opposed to someone who has forgiveness matched with humor. That person's forgiving process is going to be funny versus the person who's very grateful, their forgiving process is going to be quite appreciative. It's going to look very, very different when it comes into real world terms. And if we could go to the next slide, strengths blindness. Strengths blindness is the idea that, that people are often unaware of their own strengths. Now, I, I think that research can be done here as well. Um, I think that this may be more true of some strengths than others, but I certainly don't know that. That's, that's my instinct as a researcher, not my reporting of results. I know in the case of, of courage, of bravery, for example, that um, people often don't recognize that they're brave. They often say things like, I just did what anyone would have done. Because often courage um, is manifested in such an automatic way. It happens so quickly, and it's so aligned with our core values that we forget to see these extraordinary acts as exactly what they are, as extraordinary. And we confuse them instead for the ordinary. Um, now, I don't know if people are blind to other, 
other strengths. I certainly know that in, in my interviews with highly courageous people, I found a lot of blindness. So one area of work with people on developing their strengths is actually waking them up to, to the idea that, that this capacity is an extraordinary thing. I, I once worked with a client who, who didn't even recognize forgiveness as a strength at all. She thought it was a weakness. So just people come with a lot of sort of baggage and misunderstanding about the strengths labels, about uh, the strengths concepts, and even whether or not that strength label fits for them. Um, so that's a great area to work with people. Um, and then if we could jump forward to strength sensitivity, it's a dartboard, picture of a dartboard. I would appreciate it. Got it. Thank you. Strength sensitivity, um, this is kind of an interesting one, and, and I, one of the last two things I'll talk about before I open it up for questions. Um, strength sensitivity is the idea that if you're working with a client and you tell a client to identify their strength and, and develop it in a certain way and then go out in the world and, and try and use their strength to, to attack their problem or issue, think about their, their issue thematically through the lens of their strength, you may be causing them psychological harm. And, and I know that that's a, a provocative thing to say, so let me explain. The, the idea here is that people will inevitably fail. In fact, it's probably one of the ways that they got so proficient at their strengths to begin with, that there was some trial and error along the way. There was some feedback from, from being energized by success or, or um, having it aligned with interests and values. Um, but occasionally, people do fail in their areas of strengths because they go out and they try and use their creativity. They, they build their website, but their website fails for factors outside of their control business partners, macroeconomic factors, um, uh, just you know, occasional poor performance. Maybe they're tired, I don't know. But, but they will fail. It is inescapable. And when people fail in an area of strength that carries with it a particular psychological sting that is much greater than if you fail in an area of weakness, which is relatively easy to absorb. It's relatively easy to write off because you know, I'm not very good at that thing anyway. It's my weakness. But when you fail in an area that is so heavily um, aligned with your core sense of self, it carries a sting. So one of the ways I, I avoid this is by predicting failure with my clients, um, by saying, you know, every once in a while you will fail, and that's actually part of the process of, of building this proficiency, of developing your strengths. Um, so, so remember that strengths are not these fixed, immutable traits that should never change, but rather they're these potentials. And these potentials are cultivated through effort, that they are relatively stable, but, but there's lots of room to work, and part of that work includes failure. Now, failure is not going to feel good to you, but it also need not completely pull the rug out from under you and, and be a threat to your core sense of personality, because even personality has some fluctuation and change. And that's strength sensitivity. The final uh, thing I want to talk about um, is the social cost of strength. So if we could have the, the next and final slide. Um, the social costs of, of strengths essentially is the idea that you can beat folks up with your strengths. That we think of strengths as being these terrific things, we value them, but people don't always value our strengths, especially if people have strengths that, that are um, sort of uh, opposed to our strengths. So I, I've put on this slide planned versus spontaneous. And if you think some, some strengths kind of fall into the planning category and some strengths kind of fall into the spontaneous category. So, so creativity could be more spontaneous. Um, bravery and courage might lead you to take more spontaneous risks at, at times versus something like prudence which, which, or self-regulation, which tend to have a bit more strategic, planful type of leaning to them. Well, when you get people with these two different types of strengths together, they often butt heads or, or have a hard time appreciating one another. Um, nothing is more frustrating to a creative that wants to generate ideas or a, a brave person that just wants to take action and charge forward than someone that's pulling back with the, the leash of prudence. And there's nothing more frustrating to someone who's prudent than someone that wants to charge forward without thinking everything through in an unwise way. 
Um, so, so really, just making sure that when you work with your clients, you you ask, you know, how is this strength use working out for you? How are others taking it? Is it connecting you or is it alienating you? And that's another area for for strength development. I know I went through that pretty quickly, but I will be modeling it for you um, in a moment in a demonstration, but I would like to open it up at this point for any questions that, that we might have gotten in. Okay, great. Thanks, Robert. I am struck by many things that you said. One thing that I really love is the is that topic of strengths blindness and and how true that is when we're really tuned in as the practitioner, kind of listening carefully to what our clients are saying. It, I, I, as I think back to clients I've had, I don't know if there's an example of someone who wasn't at least somewhat blind to some of their potential. That was that wasn't somewhat blind to some a, a way that they could use their strength in a way that would help serve them more for their goals. And so I I think that's a wonderful thing. And I like how you said uh, it's about kind of waking the person up and and helping them to see how these strengths are extraordinary and uh, there's so much potential in them. Uh, one question that came in. Uh, is uh, it's a couple of questions. Here's the first one. Uh, this guy says, Dr. Biswastiner, I'm. This is from Bud Palak. I'm in the education field, working with wellness coaches in our practicum. We practice coaching. Uh, I've enjoyed exploring your ideas presented in your Practicing Positive Psychology Coaching book. What would be your advice in guiding us to best practices and learning to use character strengths with clients interested in working with wellness coaches and students interested in learning to use strengths with clients? So that's the first part of his question. And then, okay. and then the next part he goes on to say, what have you seen that really works best, especially in coaching, guiding others in self-discovery self rather than just doing therapy? And he says there's so much in and behind your model, but perhaps some top-level guidance can help steer us even better. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's a good, good uh, set of questions and obviously um, some you know, questions I, I probably could spend a whole hour on. So I might um, end up having to give you short shrift in a, in a bit, but um, only because there's so much to say. But um, I, I think you know, best practices uh, in any field, whether that's psychotherapy or, or coaching, are, are um, best learned by ensconcing yourself in professional societies and keeping up with ethic codes in ensconcing yourself in, in the, the new research literature so you keep abreast of, of new developments, you know the, the limitations of what you do. Um, part, of, part of what I think about positive psychology in general is, is we hear that word positive, and so we, we take that as a green light to use any intervention we've come across. Like, well, obviously it's positive, so there's very little harm or risk uh, potential to, to clients. But I don't think that's true, because I think that we forget the, the second half of that phrase, which is psychology. Um, and that is when we do these things, we're actually doing psychological intervention that affects people's well-being, and occasionally we affect people's well-being um, adversely. Uh, so I think that, that the best practice has to do with being a reflective practitioner, making sure that, that you have ethical practice, that you're part of a, a supervision group or peer supervision group where you have a place that you can ask questions, uh, present cases. Uh, we certainly do that in-house here at Positive Acorn once a week. Uh, me and my staff are, are presenting questions, asking if we did the right thing, what we might have done differently, and constantly working on that kind of um, professional development. Um, having said all that, I, I admit I kind of lost track of the, the second half of the question, so I think we might have to um, just hold it there and hope that Bud is satisfied with that and go on to the second question. Okay, that's great. Okay, so one more uh, set here. Uh, this person is asking, so are you saying that strengths can be simultaneously both states and traits, or are some more trait-like and some more state-like? and it depends on the individual. Uh, and then if so, uh, how can we use that knowledge in our coaching practice? Okay, um, yeah, it's, it's, the question's a great question. It's phrased in a bit of a tricky way. Um, I guess the kind of the short thumbnail answer without parsing words or getting into arguments about meaning is, yeah, they kind of are states and traits. Um, you know, there, there's a trait-like center that is stable from, 
from time to time, especially over long periods of time. You're not going to find, um, you know, incredibly adventuresome, risk-taking, brave people that hold themselves out as authentic suddenly becoming timid wallflowers without some kind of major, major uh, traumatic life event happening to them. I mean, these, these things are definitely trait-like at the very least in that they do have genetic uh, correlations and they are stable. But they are also quite changeable and flexible, um, and they are predictably so. And they are they are flexible and changeable depending on situational influences, um, and depending on on um, the amount of of um, attention given to them. So, so how much? I mean, do you want me to give you a percentage? Do I think they're this amount trait, this amount state? I I don't have that for you. Um, nor do I have the, the answer to the, the question of um, are they, does this differ from strength to strength. My instinct is actually that it probably does, that some of them um, are, are um, a bit more stable than others. Um, but, you know, even that, that's an empirical question. There, there is a bit of research on it. Um, but how can we use this? I think you, you focus largely on the stable part to reinforce the positive aspects of your client. Wow, you're a grateful person. You're a creative person. Isn't that great? You can kind of count on that, um, and that because that's stable. Um, but you use the the non-stable part, the state-like part, to say here is your area of growth. This is where things can change. Even though you're a creative person, even though you're a grateful person, you can get better at it. You can tweak it and play with it and, and move with it. You can sometimes fail at it. You can sometimes use it in a, in, in a wrong way or beat someone else up with it. And that's why we're going to get even better at this. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Cool. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and if anybody, in terms of other questions, feel free to keep throwing them at me at Ryan at viacharacter.org, Ryan at viacharacter.org, uh, and there might be a little bit of time at the very end after Robert's uh, coaching demonstration to, uh, to handle uh, one or two more questions. Um, so at this point, Robert, if it's okay, I'm going to actually bring in uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a helpy. If you're the helper and this person's the helpy, I, I put out a, a sort of a, a call um, to one of the listservs and asks if there was any volunteers um, that would like to volunteer for a coaching demonstration on strengths. And this this woman, her name is Rochelle, uh, graciously volunteered. And so I'm going to unmute her line. And uh, and I just want you to to know that. Um, uh, and I want actually the group to know that. Uh, Robert doesn't know anything about this person other than what I've just said, that her name is Rochelle, doesn't know any details or background about this. And so let me see if I can introduce the two of you together here. Rochelle, are you on the line now? Uh, Rochelle? Let's see, it's not coming in at this point. Um, let's see. Uh, we might actually have to have Rochelle call in. Um, okay. Ro Ro Rochelle, you can find the number uh, up at the top of, uh, of your screen. Let's see if there's anything else I can do here. I can talk a little bit while you um, take care of that and follow up and hopefully give Rochelle a little bit of time to, to call in. Um, a few Great. things Thanks. I want to um, just say to um, everyone on the line um, and especially to Rochelle is um, what I'm going to be doing is, is just a very short 10-minute coaching demonstration. I'll start the demonstration the way I would start any coaching session by, by establishing an agenda. And that agenda essentially for me has two parts. That is, I want to know what Rochelle's going to talk about. That is the topic, the issue we're going to address. But that in itself is not truly the agenda. The agenda is the second part, which is what does Rochelle want to get out of talking about it? That, that's sort of our take home 
but but interestingly, that that would just be a normal coaching uh, session I might have with a client. But for our purposes here, um, what's going to happen is I have my own agenda, and my own agenda is to make a demonstration to you all, everyone who is listening, and that demonstration is going to be um, identifying and working with strengths and and talking about some of these areas of strengths development. So I have to overlay my own agenda on top of of whatever Rochelle wants to talk about. Um, just so you know that that this isn't a hundred percent what I would typically do. I would typically not bring my own agenda to the coaching session and and you know muscle muscle my way into the, what the client wants to talk about. Um, so do we have Rochelle on the line? Uh, we're still waiting. Not sure why we're having the technical problem, but we could always. Um, there was a couple slides that we we missed, Robert. So I, while we're waiting for Rochelle, you had a slide called "Can Strengths Cause Harm?" Fixed or Growth Mindset. Um, there might yeah, be one of well, them. The, sure. I, if you want to put that one up, I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay. Um, the 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 last two topics that um, that I talked about strength sensitivity that is people are particularly sensitive to failure uh, when using their strengths and the social costs of strengths these these are two ways that I think that strengths use can actually cause harm um, and and some of my antidote to this if you will comes out of the work of uh, Carol Dweck. Um, a mindset research at Stanford University, um, and and Carol really studied uh, precocious children, um, uh, highly intelligent but often underperforming, and what she found was that that sometimes these highly intelligent kids did very well on tests, got very good grades, and sometimes they were what we know as classic underachievers who who despite their intellectual capacity would would perform poorly. And she found that for some of these kids, the, the reason they, they perform poorly is they kind of just gave up effort. They, they didn't try. Um, and, and what separated these groups, of course, was not their intelligence. They, they were well matched in terms of, of their intelligence, but rather whether they saw their intelligence as something that was fixed, something that was trait-like, or something that um, could be grown, something that was changeable and malleable. Um, it, it, it's Dweck's work that really, more than any other single um, uh, research paradigm, informed my own approach to, to strengths development. The same very idea of are strengths simply fixed or can we view them in a growth capacity? Um, and, and I definitely favor the latter. Um, so when when my when my clients come in for my very first session and I tell them we're going to be working with strengths, it's one of the modalities that, that I, I I use. I use strengths assessment tools. Um, really, what what we're going to do is talk about strengths, but I educate them very early on that I do not think of strengths as as just fixed traits, and that I believe that it's probably harmful to conceptualize strengths in this way because it will lead to less resistance to failure when it occurs. It will lead to um, less social sensitivity and, and more beating up of, of other people. So um, I, I would certainly recommend uh, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, to, to people, although it doesn't specifically talk about the via or, or character strengths per se. Um, I think the, the lessons about intelligence and performance are as germane to, to this field as they are to her original source of research. Hello? Okay, great. Uh, do we have... Hello, can you hear me now? Rochelle, are you on the line? Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that Rochelle? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, let, I'll hand it over to, to Robert for the two of you now. Thanks, okay, thanks, thanks Robert. Thank thanks, Rochelle. Okay, hi Rochelle. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to hear you speak today. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So what's going to happen is I'm going to take about um, seven minutes with you. It's not going to be very long, and I'm going to ask you to um, to to talk about some issue. I want to remind you that you're being recorded for posterity here. So please, you know, of course, choose an issue that that you feel safe and comfortable to talk about. Um, realize also that there's going to be no confidentiality here. Um, and I want to know uh, both what you want to talk about and what you want to get out of talking about it. And I also want to warn you that I am a very assertive, interactive coach, 
and I will be jumping in to interrupt you and cut you off, not because I'm a rude person, but um, in part just to keep an eye on the time. So I hope you don't mind that. Not, not at all. Um, I, I really didn't think of a particular thing to, to speak with you about. Um, I, I think that probably one of the areas I would like to work on in my life to change is um, to use my strength to commit to and, and follow through on making change in my life. Okay. And, are are and you making a particular change right now that, that you are interested in talking about? Well, um, one of them is that I, um, I'm older, but I just finished my VA, and I had been caring for an uncle for many years who had Alzheimer's. And so now I would like to go to graduate school, um, but I also am weighing the cost of pursuing a career, whether as a counselor or coach, or whether I should go back into the IT industry, which really doesn't interest me but pays me a lot more money. And okay. So, so if we had six minutes to work together, what would you want to walk out of that six minutes with? Um, I guess the confirmation that what I desire versus what I'm capable of or what I've been doing is, is worthwhile to pursue. You want confirmation from me that your own desires are worthwhile? Well, not confirmation that my desires are worthwhile, that my decision-making process may be legitimate or that, I, hmm. You know, like even, even like in the area of going on a diet and exercising more, um, I, I, I start doing something and then I, I falter. So okay. it's kind of like sticking with something. Okay. So, so it sounds like you, you want a little bit of, of opportunity to reflect on your own process, to, to ask the question, am I going about things the right way? Um, am I doing what I can and where stick with itness is concerned? And if we just offer you a few minutes of reflection and I offer you some probing questions around that, will that feel good to you? Absolutely. And, and just to let you know, I had a 30-minute one-on-one with Ryan back in July, and one thing he said has dramatically changed my life. So in 30 minutes, he made this huge shift in my way of thinking. So <laughs> since you're, you're an expert, you can do it in seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm not going to – I'm not in competition with Ryan for one no, thing, I but uh, <laughs> I'm – I uh, we'll we'll see what we can get to. Um, one of one of the things that that strikes me. I'm just going to start off with your strengths because it seems like if you're worried about sticking with it and you're worried about your performance on things like um, making decisions, on sticking with a diet or or maintaining your health, those types of things, you know, strengths may be may be assets uh, along the the that direction. Um, so it it occurs to me that um, you likely have a, a, a group of strengths. I've, I've written down some that I've noticed in you. I don't know if they're your, you know, your top five, if we want to artificially limit ourselves to those, but I've certainly seen um, gratitude, generosity, kindness, and love of learning in the last couple minutes with you. Okay, so kindness and love of learning are t my top one, too. <laughs> okay, good. So we're looking at the same thing. Uh, apparently the, the VIA agrees with me or I agree with the VIA that you seem to be a very kind person and you seem to enjoy the, the process of, of growth through learning, learning about yourself, learning about uh, intellectual things, learning about ideas, people, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's so um, when you when you uh, go about the process of um, you know the deciding what's best for you, and here I don't care if we're talking about a diet or going back to grad school or or getting an IT job, how are you currently using your your number one your kindness in that process? Um, I am very much an outwardly kind person. Ah, I, it makes me curious um, how much you're an inwardly kind person. Um, 
my bottom five strengths are love, gratitude, zest, and hope. Inwardly, and to me, those are, and, and self-regulation. So I would say that inwardly, I'm not kind. Outwardly, I am. So you're kind to others, but not to yourself. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Exactly. OK. Um, so it's interesting to me that you actually mentally separate those things, that kindness is something that is external, but it really, if, if it's internal, it's something totally different. And you've made all these other labels for it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. It's, it's just to how I think I, I have channeled you know, my past and how I, I then live things out. OK. Uh, so how's that working out for you? It's not. <laughs> well, well. Then, then what if we just plant a seed right here? You don't have to accept this. But what if we um, just plant a seed for you to think about that, that kindness works both directions? So you know, when you work on a diet and you don't succeed 100%, or if you, you know, fail in an area, that, that you can expend, extend a bit of compassion to yourself. OK. <laughs> That's difficult for me to do. But I, Did you say? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm merely asking for you to, to consider the possibility that kindness can be directed inward. OK. I accept that. OK. If you accept that, when would it be appropriate for someone to do that? Um, I think that my inner voice is always for myself negative. And so it's, um, it's helpful if my inner voice could turn more positive and, and not be that always unkind voice, but become a kind voice. I love what you're talking about here. It, it, it's almost like taking the thing that, that, that's habitual for you, this lifelong habit or you know, that way of going about the world, um, and saying, I want to I wanna learn a new skill, a, a learn a new way of doing it. Is that, is that kind of correct? I... Yes, and I, I was very, I, I really appreciated when you were talking about, you know, strength sensitivity and traits. And, and, you know, even if we say something is a trait, we still can expand the way we use that trait rather than just keep on using it the same narrow way we've been using it. So okay. I really, really, that resonated with me. Great. So, so you're kind of sold on the idea, at least in the abstract, which is all I'm asking you to be sold on in the one minute we have left. Um, but, but, so maybe we could think of kindness as as sort of the state-like entity. It's kind of like a skill, if you will. Um, you know that that it is. We can count on you for it. Certainly, it's a it's a trait in that respect. But it's also a trait that you could probably hone and get better at in terms of the skill of kindness. Um, it occurs to me that you're, you're very good at learning, because love of learning is, you've said, your number two strength. So if you were learning any skill, whether it was the Portuguese language or, or you know, how to sail a boat, um, how would you go about learning process? You don't have to answer that. So that's a rhetorical question. Um, and I would say, take that love of learning and say, how would you learn this new skill? What would you do to learn the skill of kindness? Well, I was hoping you were going to answer that when that guy asked that question about best practices. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, well, that's, that's, not, that's not what coaches do. I'm not here to answer your questions. <laughs> I'm here to ask them. You've got to do the answers. That's the work for you that we'll send you out the door with um, as, as a homework assignment. Uh, I, I would guess, you know, there's you know, all the normal aspects of learning, you know, talking to other people, how do they do it, finding books on the topic practice, trial and error, a little bit of failure, you know, I mean, those are, those are kind of the way things, uh, you know, way people learn things, but you already know that because you're good at it. Um, so, so let's, if you're willing to accept that homework assignment, let's send you out the door um, practicing to use your love of learning on your kindness. That Ooh, even though you're good at fun. kindness in, in one respect, Let's use your love of learning on your kindness so that we kind of get this constellation going um, so that, that you're, you're learning about uh, a whole new aspect of kindness. 
Okay. I'll, I'll take the bait. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry that our time is so short, but I really appreciate your courage in, um, in volunteering. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the insight you provided. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really try to focus on that, so thank you. Sure. Okay. Back to you, Ryan. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you both for, for your courage, Robert, in doing that, to doing demonstration, and Rochelle for, for uh, being a volunteer, and thanks for persevering, too, with the technical problems. Um, it, Robert, I just wanted to throw it back to you. Any, any kind of debriefing comments that you would make for the, for the audience? Uh, just, I'm not going to take the risk of opening the line to all these different people, because then we'll have lots of background noise and that. I mean, ideally... We would just hear feedback sure, from the audience, but any. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I would like to just to say, I mean, typically, I, I would stick more with the client's agenda, and, and she said, you know, she had a specific agenda about, um, you know, making a decision for for graduate school and work, and I, I sort of set that aside, and I did it intentionally um, for the purposes of our demonstration because I wanted to point out um, how I think about strengths, that I was looking at strengths in Constellation, that I was actually doing a bit of strength spotting. I was, I was on the lookout for her strengths. I was writing down the, the, the via strengths when I, when I saw them in her expressed um, with her enthusiasm when she used words like, like generosity or appreciation. Um, and I also was coming from the point of view that, that even though these are fantastic things for her, she still has room to grow. Even though she's probably been a kind person her whole life, I still take the fundamental approach that she could hone it. She could get better at it in all the t different types of ways that, that I mentioned before. And what better way to do that than actually to use her other strengths in that process? Yeah, it was a great demonstration of how just dynamic this process is, and and then you bringing in the idea of of kindness, which often people think just kind of as a as an outward directed kind of strength, but then kind of helping to to kind of frame it more dynamically that it can be applied inward as any of the strengths can be. And I thought that was nice too. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'd be happy to take one or two. I know we're at the top of the hour, but I'd I'd be happy to um, take one or two you know, final questions before we go? Sure. Okay. Uh, one question uh, comes from Jerry Bowie who asks, uh, how do you compare VIA and the Realize 2? Uh, in other words, how do they complement one another? How might you use them together in practice? Okay. Um, so, so what Jerry's asking about is two different strengths assessments, and um, they, they are different. Um, there, there are things I like about both of them. Um, one of the things I really love about the VIA is that it has a few number of strengths, that is 24, so it's, it's very easy to sort of <laughs> learn them and, and remember them and have them quick at, at your fingertips and on the tip of your tongue. Um, and they have, uh, I think of all the strengths assessments, the VIA has the most common sense and, and, and sort of straightforward language. I mean, people get, if I say creativity or leadership or teamwork or, or kindness um, or zest, they, they basically know what I mean. They don't have to scratch their head and puzzle over, you know, the kind of the specific definition. Um, and one of the things I like about the Realize, too, is that it has 60 strengths. So um, you, you, you tend not to be able to memorize all of those, but I kind of like having a, a wider palette um, uh, at times as well. So, you know, I think there are, there are basically pros and, and cons, um, not only to those two, but to, to the other ones, you know, sort of that are, that are out there and available. Okay, great. Thanks. And uh, another question. Hello, Robert. I recently taught a course here in Switzerland on character strengths and virtues at an adult university. One approach I used was to train the participants in mindfulness practice to, in order to create more awareness about how they, were, they are driving their strengths. What research is there, if any, about mindfulness and its impact on appropriate use of strengths? Thanks. <laughs> it's a bit of a loaded question because... Um, I'm not a mindfulness expert, and, and you are, Ryan, so I almost feel like you should take that, that, that question. <laughs> <laughs> Passing it over to me, huh? No. Absolutely. 
Uh, well, is there anything you'd want to say about um, the, the connection of, of maybe just having a general awareness and sort of a, a non-judging curiosity about oneself and, and strengths in general? Anything about that interface that you, well, you would I, say? I would back it up even further than, than, um, than mindfulness, really. And one of the articles that I really love um, by Barry Schwartz at Swarthmore University says that kind of wisdom is essentially a, a strength that's different than all the other strengths because it is a medicine strength. It's the strength that regulates the other strengths. So you can, be, you can be creative, you can have love of learning, but it's wisdom that will tell you um, exactly how much you should be doing those, when you should be doing those, and how you should be doing those. And I, I kind of view mindfulness as, as sort of in that same type of category. Mindfulness is, is sort of a, this, this reflective, non-judgmental, um, you know, sort of appreciative skill that, um, that, that sort of gives you a nice overview of of those other strengths and does you know kind of make uh, the subtle and and overt suggestion of how they are best used and developed I, I think that's a great way to say it in terms of uh, acting as a, a meta strength and and it's a bit of a tricky question just because there isn't a lot of research that connects mindfulness specifically with with character strengths. I mean, there's research on mindfulness with a particular given strength, like maybe with creativity and how it can enhance creativity, and and with other and several other strengths. But there, but not as much on empirically looking at character strengths in general and mindfulness. But I do happen to know that there are some uh, mindfulness researchers that are looking at that with the VIA survey and with main kind of major mindfulness instruments. And so that there's a couple studies that are coming out uh, next year on this topic. And so um, and I'm happy to go into a lot more detail on this if that person wants to email me. Um, and I have some articles on the topic too. But, but anyway, um, well, uh, maybe would it be a good point to wrap it up? Any kind of concluding thoughts, Robert? I, I, I just I certainly want to express my gratitude to you for for being such a, a wonderful and dynamic presenter. And I know a lot of people will get a lot of use out of this experience and out of the demonstration. And and any kind of closing comments that you you'd like to make? Um, just just to thank everyone for being on the line and to to um, offer the the prescription that if you use strengths, if you use positive psychology in any kind of interventionist way, I, I highly encourage you uh, not just to get your, your um, sources from, from blogs and, and online sources and, and popular books by researchers, but by actually keeping abreast of the research as it comes out so that you can be a, a mindful and reflective practitioner who, who considers things carefully and, and considers the risk of, of harm, even though largely what we're doing is, is positive and has a positive impact on people. Perfect. Well said. And, and everybody, uh, t keep on the lookout for Robert's book, n newest book coming out called The Courage Quotient. Do we know n in 2012 when that's coming out, Robert? When can we look April for 10th. it? Oh, wow. April 10th. Oh, <laughs> wow. You got it right on your fingertips. That's great. Okay, so <laughs> April 10th. Uh, be sure to look for that. I, I know I will as well. Well, thank you all for uh, attending, and uh, we will see you next month at the VIA Pioneer Speaker Series. Have a great week. Bye, everyone.